All right, well, let's <clears throat> go ahead and dig in. And let's begin with a running start. Again, I do want to review a little bit each time just to see where we're at in the argument, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. So far, Paul has told us that for God to justify us, for Him to accept us, we need to keep His commandments. But the problem, Paul says, is that none of us actually have done this because none of us can do this as we come into the world. The first Adam made that impossible through his one act of disobedience. And so the Lord in his mercy provided another way. He sent his son, the second Adam, to obey for us. Now again, the, uh, Paul wraps up everything Jesus did in his one act of obedience, which would be his death in the, on the cross. But we know it's his life and his death. So that we might be justified in Him, by trusting in Him. Paul says this is how Abraham was justified. God didn't accept Abraham, didn't bring him into covenant with him, into this relationship because Abraham was a good man. Abraham believed God's promise to send his Messiah into the world, and God gave Abraham his righteousness, that is the righteousness of his son who was to come and that is how he was accepted by God. Now, Paul tells us when we believe, when we trust in Jesus, we also receive that same righteousness. God justifies us. God accepts us. The warfare between us comes to an end. We have peace with him now. We're actually his children now. He loves us. Our situation was hopeless, but now we have the hope of heaven. Before, the difficulties that we had to face in life were God's judgments against us for our sins, but now He uses them for our good. By the way, as we were singing that hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, you know, there's that part where it says, Sin, Grief, and Pain. No, actually, that was the first one. Sing, grief, and, sin, Grief, and Pain, and we, we think about, do I, really want, <laughs> do I really want to pray that? Do I really want grief and pain? Well, we know the Lord's going to send it, Okay. He's going to send tribulation and difficulties, but the good news is He uses it for our good, and that's why it's in the lyric, right? That's why the prayer, send it, because these are your messengers to me for my good. They, God, He uses these situations to more, make us more like Christ, even though we don't like it, okay? But that's just the way it is. That's the way the Lord works. Well, Paul goes on, now that we are in union with Christ, now that we have died with Him, now that we have been raised with Him, we are no longer the slaves of sin, but of righteousness. So Paul said we should no longer see ourselves as, um, you know, those who are alive apart from Christ, but we should see ourselves now as those who have died with Him, who were buried with Him. We are in the cemetery but then God in His mercy called us out of the grave by that effectual call of the Holy Spirit through the gospel. We have been raised now to life to serve Him. Alive from the dead now, we, this new life now only to serve Him. Again, as those who are alive from the dead, that's our only purpose. Okay. Now, that's where Paul left us last week in Romans chapter 6, and it may sound from what Paul was saying in Romans 6 that that means there's a smooth road ahead of us, you know, smooth sailing, dead to sin, alive to God. We're alive now only to serve Him. But Paul goes on to tell us there will be a struggle. Jesus has broken the power of sin. It can no longer command us, but Paul wants to remind us this morning that it isn't entirely gone, as if we needed a reminder. But this, this can be, again, very, very helpful, very comforting. Now, first of all, Paul again assures us in verses 1 through 6 that the law can no longer condemn us now that we are in Christ. That's what this whole thing is about. He begins in verse 1, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law. Again, he's dressing the Jews because the law has much to do with them. They have a very high appreciation for it. And he wants to make sure they understand it. Do you not know, brethren, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? Now, again, that's the terminus, okay? The law only has jurisdiction as long as you're alive. 
But Paul just told us that we're not alive. We are dead. We have died with Christ, and we have a new relationship with Him. So Paul wants to illustrate that now through marriage. That's what this is all about. It is used merely as an illustration, okay? He says that a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. Now, we understand that marriage is a lifelong covenant of companionship. When we enter into it, it should be for life. That should be our commitment. Now, she's bound to her husband as long as he's alive because of this covenant, but if he dies, she is no longer bound. The law no longer applies. The marriage has come to an end. You know, some people think marriage goes on forever. I had a professor in college who believed that, but that's not what our Lord is telling us. He says marriage ends. Sorry to say. When our lives end here, okay? Now, if she were to marry somebody else while he was still alive, the law would condemn her as an adulteress because she's still married to her first husband. Okay, now this is not taking into account the other things the Bible says about marriage and divorce, but this, this is just taking into account she's married, but while she's married, she gets into a marriage covenant with somebody else. Perhaps, um, maybe what's more in view here is the idea is that she has divorced her husband for less than biblical grounds, and she's marrying somebody else, and she's committing adultery. Paul says, he's implying, because she is still married to her first husband. But if he's dead, okay, if he, he's died, she hasn't committed adultery because the marriage covenant has come to an end. Remember what Paul tells us also in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, that if a person is free from their marriage covenant, a woman is freed from it because her husband has died, she has the liberty to marry again. He says that specifically. But, he says, to the believer only in the Lord. That is, if you are free from a marriage, you can marry again if you want to, but make sure it's a Christian. Now again, remember that this is just an illustration. It's not a full treatment of marriage and divorce. You know, the Bible does talk about other grounds upon which a marriage may be dissolved. Jesus tells us in Matthew 19, verse 9, that if her husband had committed adultery, then she could divorce him and marry somebody else because he would have broken that covenant. She could sue for a divorce. That would be the end of that marriage. She's free to marry somebody else. Jesus says that quite plainly. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians seven fifteen that if her husband had abandoned her, which means perhaps one of two things, well, certainly one of these two things or both, if he says, I'm leaving, and he takes off, or I'm divorcing you, and he takes off, or I'm going to stay married to you, but I'm not going to do anything that I promised to you, I'm not going to love you, I'm not going to provide for you, I'm not going to protect you, I'm not even going to cohabit with you. You know, I actually ran into a situation like that one time, Don and I did, with somebody who was in that situation. It was a man married to a woman, she was Roman Catholic. He had become Protestant. She says, I'm not going to divorce you. I'm going to live in the same house with you, but I'm going to be in this room. You're going to be in that room, and we're going to interact you know, as we sort of cross paths, but that's about it. Well, you know what? She had abandoned their marriage covenant because there's much more involved in it than just that, right? So that's another grounds to end the marriage. She could divorce him and marry someone Else. And the reason I bring that up is because some people treat this passage in Romans chapter 7 as the only thing the Bible has to say on the subject. And they conclude from this that there is no divorce and remarriage because if the other spouse is alive under any circumstances and you marry somebody else, you've committed adultery. But that isn't the case. Okay, as I've already told you, Jesus and Paul say otherwise. Paul is simply using this as an example of how death changes, how the law applies, okay? And his point is this, we were married to the law. We came into the world under the law to be justified or condemned by the law, but now that we're, we have died with Christ 
and have been raised with Him, we are no longer bound to the law. The law is no longer our husband, so to speak. But we've been joined to another. We've been joined to Christ. We have remarried. Okay? That's what Paul is, is telling us. Now, not only does that mean the law can no longer condemn us because we're no longer under the law, but it also makes a difference in the way we live. Now, Paul starts by saying, before, when we were under the law, all the law would do for us is provoke our sinful desires, and that would move us to do the things that led to death. Okay? Now, Paul's going to elaborate on that a little bit more, so we'll pass over that. But he says, now that we've been joined with Christ and we have His Spirit, in verse 6, we have the power to obey the law because we have a new heart. We want to do the right things. Now remember, this is kind of review. Last week we noted that this, this is what Jonathan Edwards said is the only difference between the believer and the unbeliever. The believer has the Spirit. The unbeliever doesn't. The believer, because he has the Spirit, wants to do what is right, wants to, to do what's holy. The unbeliever, because he doesn't have the Spirit, doesn't want to do that. So we have a new power to obey the law. Now, in this second section, verses 7 through 13, Paul wants us to understand that the problem that he's discussing here is not with the law. He's not telling the Jews the law is a bad thing. Far from it, the law is a very good thing. All these negative effects that the law has on us that Paul is talking about could lead us to the conclusion that the law is really the problem. No, he says, it's our sin, our response to the law to God's holy requirements. The law is good. We are the problem. So he begins by saying this in verse 7. What should we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. Again, this is that statement of Paul when he wants to push it as far out of the realm of possibility as possible. This is the expression he uses. May it never even come into your mind. May it never even, you know, possibly, can't possibly exist. He says, on the contrary... I would, have, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. Now, we already, we already saw in Romans 5 that this is why God gave the law. He says, the law came in so that the transgression would increase. And again, if that sentence doesn't make a lot of sense, that, that's why I say some things are hard to understand what Paul is saying, but this is what he's talking about. God gave the law so that transgression would increase. Well, how does it increase? Well, without the law, Paul says, first of all, we wouldn't know what sin is. Paul wouldn't have known what coveting is if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Now, Paul's not saying that he wasn't coveting before the law came. He's just simply saying he didn't know that he was coveting. This is one way that the law makes the transgression increase. It shows us our sins, okay? So now we see there's a lot of sin when, as we're going to see, maybe we thought there wasn't much at all, if, if any. But Paul gives us another, shows us another way the law actually makes the transgression increase. He says the law stirs up the sin that's already in our hearts. He says in verse 8 of Romans 7, Sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. That's interesting, isn't it? The law is producing this reaction in Paul. Now, what Paul is doing here is he's describing the nature of the sin that is inside our hearts, the evil, the corruption. When God tells us, I want you to do this, our sinful response is just the opposite. I don't want to do that. By the way, as Christians, we still kind of have that struggle, don't we? God says, do this, and our hearts almost say, immediately say, I don't want to do that. It's kind of like when you're raising your children. <laughs> you know, when you tell your children, I don't know if any of you had such complacent children, they did everything you told them to do, but we didn't find that to be the case with ours, okay? You tell them to do something, and their first response after they learn how to communicate verbally is no. And before they learn to verbally communicate is, is to really go the, do the opposite kind of thing. 
you know, it's, it's really the, the old illustration is the do not touch wet paint sign. You know, you, you want to touch it because the sign says you can't, okay? <laughs> you always want to do what you're told you can't do. Well, this is what Paul means when he says, apart from the law, sin is dead. Uh, he doesn't mean it's not there. He simply means it's dormant until it's provoked by the law. So he was coveting before he understood the law. But now he saw that he was coveting, first of all. But when the law said, you shall not covet, suddenly he found himself wanting to covet a lot. You know, it produced all this coveting. He coveted more. Now, this also makes sense of what Paul is talking about in Romans, or excuse me, in verse 9, when he says, I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. Some people understand Paul here is teaching an age of accountability. Okay, um, if we don't know it's wrong, God's not going to hold us accountable until we understand, which means that if we're children and we don't understand, you know, what we're doing is wrong at all, then we're innocent and, and we're guiltless. And if, if we die, uh, we'll go to heaven. But that's really not what the Bible teaches, does it? It teaches we're all dead in Adam and we need to be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a whole different topic, but... The idea is this doesn't teach an age of accountability. That's not what Paul's saying. What he is saying is this. Well, first of all, he's not saying that he was alive spiritually, that he was on his way to heaven. And then he understood the law, and he realized he was a sinner. Uh, and so then he died. But what he means is this. He thought that he was okay. He thought he was alive before he understood the law. But once he saw all the coveting, and all the sin, everything that sin was producing in his life through the law, he suddenly realized he wasn't as good as he thought he was. You know, what Paul may be describing here was his conversion from a Pharisee to a Christian. You know, uh, what happened when the Lord brought him to himself? As a Pharisee, he thought he was blameless. He thought he was alive. He thought he was justified by his works. But when he met Christ, he realized that all of his righteousness was nothing more than a great hill of, of dung, of refuse. It wasn't good. He realized he was dead and he needed Christ. Now, so what he says here to conclude the section, he realized that the commandment that promised life, remember the commandment says, do this and you will live. That's what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. Do this and you will live. He's quoting Leviticus 18, verse 5, that this law, which was to produce life, you know, Theoretically, it could if you could obey it. It ended up killing him instead. He said sin deceived him into thinking he was good enough. But instead, when the law came, it was strengthened and it killed him. So Paul is asking this question in this section, who is the real villain here? Is it the law because the law pointed out my sin and produced all this coveting? Well, there are those who say it is. The law really is the problem. They say that when God first gave His law on Mount Sinai, that the, the proper response that God wanted from all of His people when He was giving the law was, we don't want that law, God. Away with this law. We want grace. We want grace. Well, that's what God was giving them, grace. Giving them grace. He, he had just redeemed them out of Egypt, and He was telling them how to live. And even if that law was given to point out their sins, to drive them, to what the Mosaic Law would teach them about their need of Christ, that was, that was still grace. Paul says, no, the law is not sin. May it never be. And notice verse 12. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Next time you run into somebody who hates the law, point them to this verse, you know. The law is good, and every believer will see it as good. The real problem is sin which we can see much more clearly now because it's able to kill us through that which is good, which is the law. Sin kills us through the law. Okay, the law is good. It's, sin is the problem. Now, finally, and here's, here's the, the, the debated part, okay, the difficult part. <clears throat> In verses 14 through 25, and let me just begin by telling you which direction I'm headed with this. Paul tells us that sin continues to be a problem even after 
we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can tell which of the two uh, views that I'm taking that. Now, this, this news is good, good news, and it's bad news. Okay, it's good, first of all, because it helps us to make sense out of our experience, especially in light of what Paul just said in, in chapter 6. You know, I'm afraid if, um, you know, there, for anybody who was here last week listening to chapter 6, I mean, they might go away with the impression, hey, if, if I'm supposed to be dead to sin and alive to God, that's not my experience, so I must not be saved, so I'm not going to come back. We need to understand that's not what Paul is saying. He says there's still going to be a, tr a struggle. So this helps us make sense out of our experience in light of what he's just said in chapter 6. That's good. But it's bad because of the sad fact that we're going to have to continue with sin until we leave this world. That's, that's the bad news. Now again, let's note that this section is one of the most debated in the Bible. Remember when Peter says that there are some things in Paul that are hard to understand? <laughs> He wasn't kidding, okay? Paul is hard to understand, and especially here. This is hard. Why do you think there's been so many commentaries written on the book of Romans trying to demonstrate exactly what, what he is saying? So what's the problem? Well, Paul appears to be talking about his own experience here. He does shift pronouns to the first person, personal pronoun, I, but it's hard to tell if he's talking about his experience before he was saved or after he was saved. Now, some things here that he says seem to indicate he was an unbeliever. As a matter of fact, the majority of the things he says seem to say that. Let me give you an example or the examples. Okay, verse 14, I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. Verse 15, I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. Verse 18, the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Verse 19, the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Verse 23, I see a different law on the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. And then verse 24, wretched man that I am who will set me free from the body of this death. Every time I read through these, I think, can Paul be saved? You know, is he express, is he, you know, especially in light of what John says in 1 John 3, 9, no one who is born of God practices sin. And didn't Paul just tell us in, in chapter 6, we're no longer the slaves of sin? And yet he seems to be saying that he's still a slave to sin. On the other hand, he does say a couple of things that, that really can only be true of the, um, the believer. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says in verse 16, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. Verse 18, the willing is present in me. Verse 19, the good that I want. Verse 21, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. And then verse 22, I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. So you have these first statements to weigh against these statements. And in light of this, there's at least four views of what Paul is saying here. One, first one is he's describing his experience as a Pharisee. He had a very high regard for the law, but being unconverted, he wasn't able to keep it because he was still a slave to sin. Well, that looks like it could be feasible. Secondly, he's describing himself in his awakened state. Okay, uh, the Jews had the law. There were times when they kept it and times they didn't keep it. And during the times they kept it, you might say they were awakened because there was a revival going on. Maybe a godly leader who was leading them in the ways of the Lord and God was pouring out His Spirit and more of these Jews were following Him. So if they're awakened, maybe this explains the high regard for the law of God. Well, the thing is, if we understand awakening properly, what we, uh, and that, by the way, awakening is this, it's usually, and not always, but usually, the first thing the Spirit of God does is He works in our conscience to make us aware of our sins, to show us our need of the Lord Jesus Christ before He brings about the new birth. In other words, He wants us to be concerned about our condition before He delivers us from that condition. 
But uh, again, there's, 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 you know, this, this might, again, explain what, what Paul is referring to here. So that's another possibility. We'll come back to that in a moment. He's describing a person, the experience of a person who's unconverted. Well, in the first two examples, the Pharisee, as a Pharisee, Paul was unconverted. As an awakened person, he was unconverted. So that's really not that much different, except a lot of unconverted people don't have any concern about the law at all. So this would have to be an unconverted person who somehow is tied to the Jewish economy, either a Jew or somebody who's awakened. Or he's describing his experience as a believer. Now, I've already told you, you know, sometimes I think, I've got it. You know, I've worked through it. I've got it. I know which, which one it is. And, and then I read it again. And I say, oh, you know, now I feel like it's the other, the other view. It, it's difficult to tell what Paul's talking about here. So, you know, is he talking about before conversion? Um, uh, you know, if he is, okay, then, then his point in this passage is to say that that bondage ends when you come to Christ and he gives you his Holy Spirit and you're free, okay? But he just resolved that in chapter 6. So again, you know, if, he, if he's saying this, he's going back to where he was in chapter 6, Okay? talking about the same thing, and, and that's possible. If he's referring to when he was awakened, basically the same thing is true. You know, I've, I've got this problem, this bondage, but the Lord will eventually deliver me. But in the meantime, this was my struggle. But if he's talking about his experience now as a believer, okay, then he is adding a new dimension here to just our experience as Christians, what we should expect to experience. What he's saying is, yes, it's true, we're no longer the slaves of sin, we're no longer going to be condemned by it, it can no longer command us, but we're still going to have to struggle with it. Now, this appears to be the majority view among Reformed scholars, and for good reasons. Let me give you some of those reasons. Think about this. First of all, if Paul was describing himself as an unconverted or an unbelieving Pharisee, he certainly has a different opinion of himself here than he does when he describes it in Philippians 3, verse 6, I mean, when you read that opening statement in Philippians 3, 6, he seems to be, you know, just sort of like, well, I've got it made. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Okay, that's how Paul pictures himself in Philippians 3, as an unconverted Pharisee. But here, he appears to be overwhelmed with his sin. O oh, wretched man that I am. He's not describing the same thing. I don't think Paul's talking about himself as an unbelieving Pharisee. Secondly, if he's describing himself as an awakened sinner, the problem is awakening does not give you a delight in the law of God. The Spirit's awakening basically makes you afraid. It strikes fear in your heart that you're under the judgment of God, and so it pushes you forward to Christ. Okay, that is not what he's describing here. He's describing some kind of love. I want to do what's right. I, I, I joyfully you know, concur with the law of God in my inner man. That's not what an awakened sinner would say. Thirdly, Paul says several things that indicates that he is viewing himself as a believer. First of all, Paul shifts gears here and talks about himself in the present tense. He says in verse 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Okay, he appears to be speaking of something he was going through at that time. He writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15. Again, this gives us some kind of grief, and this was toward the end of his life. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Not that I was, but that I am. So Paul still sees himself as the greatest of sinners. Oh, wretched man that I am. Okay. Secondly, he's describing a struggle that he's having. Now think about this as we're you know, talking about free will. You know, unbelievers have the freedom to choose what they want, and because they can choose what they want, there's no struggle. Right? They always choose what they want. What they want is always sin. There's no struggle there. Unbelievers don't struggle because they only want one thing, sin. The struggle begins when we want two things. Okay? We have to choose between two things, 
you know, if you only have one choice, there's a struggle, but if you have two, righteousness and sin, that's only true of believers. And that appears to be what Paul is struggling with right here. Thirdly, we've already seen, he says essentially the same thing to the Galatians, and there's no question there that he's, what he's talking about. He's talking about believers and the struggles they have with sin. And again, listen to what he says in, in chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, and notice this, so that you may not do the things that you please. Isn't that the same thing he's saying in Romans chapter 7? That's the thing we're having a hard time understanding. What do you mean? I'm set free from sin, but I still can't do what I'm supposed to. Well, it's because there are things we have to do to overcome this difficulty. All right, so the, the point is this. Even though we have died and been raised with Christ, even though we have His Spirit and we love His law and we want to keep it perfectly, we, we joyfully concur, we delight in the inner man, in the new man, in the new nature. We won't be able to because of the sin that is still present in our hearts. Now, again, that can be very comforting because it helps us to make sense out of our experience. You know, have you ever read John chapter 1? Well, actually, 1 John. Okay, 1 John. No one who is born of God sins. You ever read that and just been, what do you mean? No one who is born of God sins. That I sin, that means I can't be born of God. And so then you begin to go through this struggle. Well, this is to help us make sense out of that because that's not what John means. What he means is nobody practices sin. And what he means is continually sins. When Paul says here that I'm practicing the very thing I don't want to do, he's not, it's not the same sense that John is referring to. It's actually a, a different word. And what he's saying is I carry out these things. I don't carry out the things I want, but I find myself carrying out the things that I don't want, and, and this is the struggle. So this can be comforting because it reminds us that even though we are believers, even though we're saved, even though all these things are true of us, we still in the present time will not be able to live as perfectly as we would like to live. We're not going to be able to live exactly the way Jesus did because our remaining sin keeps getting in our way. Well, so Paul's painting the problem. He hasn't given us the solution yet, has he? And this is where we're going to have to close this time and say, well, come back next week, you know, for the <laughs> exciting conclusion, because Paul tells us next time, what is it that we need to do in order to overcome the sin? Is it possible, first of all? How can we overcome it? How can we do better? Well, again, read ahead and try to come to grips with what Paul is, is telling us here, but let's just simply say the Lord is giving to us everything that we need. We just simply need to use what it is He has given to us and start making good choices. Okay. All right, well, let's, let's close here and bow in a moment of prayer. And as we uh, think about the things we've just looked at, let's use them to prepare us for coming to the table.